Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 460, featuring an interview with none other than Chris and Nick Bischoff, the brothers of the Brotherhood. Now you may know these names, they are responsible for Stasis, uh, the upcoming Stasis Bone Totem that we'll cover in this episode, along with their earlier stuff. Uh, of course, Beautiful Desolation, one of the most attractive uh, artistically uh, beautiful games I've ever seen, frankly. I just covered that in the previous match yet. Uh, they've also done uh, a game called Kane that they released for free, and they worked on uh, Wasteland 3, of course, with uh, Brian Fargo. Anyway, in this episode, we talk about all of those games. We get into what they think about crowdfunding. Uh, they actually have their own sort of do-it-yourself solution and some advice uh, for people that may looking uh, may be thinking about that route as a way of funding their game. Uh, they also talk about point-and-click adventures, what's the future of that genre, what makes it special, uh, their inspirations. Uh, they talk about Chris's uh, photographic approach. Uh, they got a, a, a fun technique where he's actually able to implement uh, real-life uh, things that he sees in his uh, country of South Africa and then work that into the graphics of the game, the, uh, the scenery and the settings. It's really uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, we also talk about philosophy, ethics, and much, much more. There's just a ton of stuff in this interview. Uh, I know you guys are really going to like it. So without further ado, here is Chris and Nick. All right, folks, I am here with Chris and Nick Bischoff of the Brotherhood. These guys are doing some of the most fantastic adventure games I've seen in a very long time. Uh, of course, Stasis and Beautiful Desolation, uh, which is one that's really been getting a, a lot of well-deserved publicity. Uh, they're also working on a new project, and hopefully we'll be able to get into that a little bit here as well. How are you guys doing today? Lovely. Lovely. Very good. It's hot here, so uh, apart from that, uh, very good. Yeah. <laughs> Going into uh, spring and summer now, so. Now, when you say hot. here, I think the viewers might be interested to know where you guys uh, are located. Where, where it's, um, <laughs> it's not in Minnesota. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, a, couple, a couple of thousand k's away. We're in, we're in uh, in Cape Town, um, on the tip of Africa. So uh, we actually right um, we're right on the tip, so where uh, the two oceans meet and. Uh, yeah, so we've got um, uh, uh, opposite seasons to you guys. Uh, we're heading into our summertime, and yeah. uh, and it gets very hot over here. Oh, you're just now heading into your summertime. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah, we got snow on the ground up here. Oh wow! <laughs> I got some questions. Uh, you might as well jump into these, I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah. Robbie Sambat, good friend of mine, good great another great artist. Uh, he was curious about what is it like being a game developer in South Africa. Any challenges or obstacles that might surprise people? Um, phew, it's a, it's a, a very complicated question. It, it, it's like a simple question. It's actually got a very complicated answer. Um, I think being a, Those are my being favorite. In, yeah, <laughs> I think being involved in any of the, um, the tech industries in South Africa uh, is, is quite a challenge. Uh, we have um, certain um, things like power grid issues that we actually have. We've only very recently got wide access to fiber and high-speed broadband internet. Um, and also our sort of like uh, currency isn't as strong as the dollar. So when it comes to um, uh, certain softwares and subscriptions and everything, it, it can be a bit of a, a bit of a hindrance. Yeah. Um, but we do have some other advantages, one of them being that the cost of living in South Africa is generally quite a bit lower than it is in other places. So our money can go a little bit further which is how we've been able to sort of run our very small micro studio, mm. being able to focus on nice niche games um, and actually sort of make a success, make a success of it. Yeah. Um, also, you know, there's um, the standard uh, the staffing issues. Obviously it's difficult to find uh, uh, the right people over here. The, the, the industry is tiny. There's only a couple of game 
game developers. Um, I think at last count, I think there's two or three hundred um, uh, game developers in South Africa, uh, but most of them are mobile, um, outsourced uh, um, divisions of other companies. Like Disney's got a division here and all that sort of thing. There are a couple of really great studios here, but um, it's uh, we, we sort of haven't been exposed to um, that level of technology like in the United States and that. So we don't have the manpower. So obviously the benefit of the internet has been we've been able to outsource um, any areas that we have um, a deficit in, in terms of our um, the technology or uh, services that we require, um, which is great for, for indie developers. So I think, um, yeah, I think Chris touched on it. Um, the biggest issue I think uh, is just stability of things like the power grid and that seems to be sorted out. Um, at the hard moment, to make games without electricity. Yeah, yeah, we. Uh, yeah, well, Stasis was, was made on a generator. I yeah, say that we, counts as a challenge. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually, I, I often joke, but I mean, when Stasis was being developed, um, we were going through massive rolling blackouts in the country, and we oh, literally wow. at some points had a petrol generator outside with an extension mm. cable going through a window. And I was operating my laptop and render computers off of petrol generators. Mm. Um, so it, it's it's it, it is it can be quite a quite a challenge, and it's things that I think that other developers in other countries would sort of be like. It, it sounds insane when you yeah. talk about. Well, that would just make a plan. I think um, also that the name Gas Power Games people. is already yeah. taken because that would be totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We I mean we just make it happen, you know that sort of thing, and uh, yeah, the people are lovely. The country, the country's weather is fantastic in that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is it is a challenge. But it's um, it's nothing we're uh, we're new to. Our, our previous uh, business, which I, we might chat about later, um, had um, was a technology business as well. So we sort of um, when we got into this, we knew what we were going to deal with. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, I think that sort of answers that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Otherwise, being a game developer is just awesome. Yeah. Just absolutely love it. I, I can't imagine doing anything else. Uh, I have another question. Well, there's two other questions here about South Africa. I think this is really fascinating to people. You know, <laughs> just, just thinking about what, yeah, you know, the, the story of, uh, you know, the geographical dimension of this, I guess. Uh, Matt Bradley Shergi wants to know, what is South African humor like? Um, <laughs> South, South African humor generally is quite, uh, is quite slapstick. Um, sort of, uh, I'm talking about mainstream humor is, is, is relatively uh, slapstick. Um, yeah, we, we sort of, South Africa is quite a melting pot of, of, um, of cultures. So we've got a, a um, sort of a, um, a, 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 we get a lot of American comedy here. We've got to get a lot of British comedy over here. So British comedy is quite popular. We have, we're not as dry as the British. Um, yeah. We're a little bit more, more fun, but um, we, we, I suppose just as serious, but we also, we, we sort of, uh, yeah, we, we get a bit of both. Yeah, sort of, uh, I, I think the thing with um, living in South Africa is that it's almost like you, you can't live here and, and not have a sense of humor. <laughs> you know, we, we've got sort of our, our I know national, the feeling. yeah, yeah. We, we, we've got our, our national sort of presidential address that, that comes out and they, especially in the last um, a couple of months and literally, 10 minutes afterwards, the memes start coming up on Facebook about things that have actually been said. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that being in South Africa, you, you have to have a bit of a sense <laughs> of humor when you actually hear, and we have to sort of like laugh at ourselves and not take things too seriously. Yeah. Well, let's see. One last question about, about along these lines. This is Matt Ricola. Mm -hmm. As South African developers and gamers, what mm -hmm. other games did you like playing when you were younger? And which do you think had the biggest influence on you now? Sure, Chris, you want to start with that? Um, probably the game that's had the biggest influence on me now that I played when I was younger is Fallout. Um, I, I can't think of many old school gamers that haven't been influenced by Fallout in, in, some, in some fashion. Um, but yes, yeah, so South Africa, uh, in terms of our, our gaming um, uh uh, you know, um, uh, the, the reach of companies into South Africa, we've always actually had a pretty good, um, a pretty good access to international gaming companies. So, you know, yeah. we, we had Tomb Raider on launch and we had a lot of the, the entertainment um, yeah. actually happen on, on launch. In the last 20 years, obviously, it's yeah. sort of been on par with what the rest of the world um, has. Um, the, eight, the 80s and early 90s, it was quite difficult to get, um, to get games. 
um, that's, you know, that's why there was so much piracy um, in the country. You just literally couldn't, there was various, up to 94, there were actually trade embargoes against the country. So it was quite difficult to source um, software. Mm. But um, after that, um, the, the markets opened up and we've had access to pretty much uh, everything out. All the consoles are, are launched here as well. And that, yeah. um, uh, you know, Microsoft uh, has got a huge campus here. Yeah, so it's not sort of, um, it's not sort of rural. We live in sort of a, a strange third world, first world dichotomy um, in this place. But uh, yeah, so we have had access to international. I think for myself, um, the most influential game would have been uh, Star Control 2, mm -hmm. which uh, is uh, my favorite game of all time. Um, and uh, we actually uh, met uh, Fred and Paul, um, the, the game developers oh, who, sure. who made it. And that was, uh, that was amazing. It was a seminal <laughs> moment. Yeah, we, we loved it. It was awesome. I uh, went for burgers with them and, uh, and beer was lovely. But um, yeah, I think Star Control 2 and uh, yeah, Chris always favored the sort of the um, RPG and adventure games. And then you know, I like Doom and, and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, I think our games are mostly influenced by Chris's tastes in, in, in games, I would, I would yeah, say. So there's, there's probably the, the Sierra adventure games because mm. I just like death oh, in, my, in my games. Yeah. And then definitely sort yeah, of like any... Say. <laughs> and then I mean definitely from uh, from Fallout um, and then all of the Infinity Engine RPGs mm. um, I sort of like I, I just consume them voraciously when, when, whenever whenever I could um, and and then uh, now um, thankfully recently we've actually now have access to a good solid broadband internet we can actually have access or fiber uh, oh, yeah fiber yeah. we actually can you know download a a 60 gig game now and it's not gonna sort of like break the bank yeah um, yeah so we, we kind of now have access to the things that everybody else <laughs> has access to well before we get into uh, into stasis and the, and the new game hmm. uh you know i'd like to know a little bit about more about your i guess you guys <laughs> yeah. like your training I, I, I know you're <laughs> former architectural illustrators yeah yeah which I don't know much about that field, but it definitely sounds like that would be highly relevant mm. uh, to level design. And exactly. Know. Well, precisely. Um, uh, my, my essentially, my father's an architect, and um, yeah, because he's because he's been um, he he was always sort of on the cutting edge of of technology, um, digital technology. They adopted in the late eighties, and his his um, firm always pushed that sort of thing. And he'd bring a computer home. And we'd play around with it. So we've sort of been exposed to computers since we were really small. Um, and I think that sort of got us um, ignited on sort of the architectural side. Uh, essentially what happened was um, in the, in the mid nineties, um, there was a, a software package called 3D Studio, um, which uh, is one of the de facto standards, of, uh, modern day standards. But at that time it was a new package. Um, there was a couple of other ones, uh, DataCAD and that. And my father was using them for very basic architectural illustration. Before they used to do everything by hand. They used to draw it out and use rulers and sort of uh, construct it. And Chris kind of got involved. My dad's, you know, helping coloring in and then move on to the computer stuff. And when I was about 11 or so, yeah. I was doing, he was, uh, yeah, sort of playing around with the software oh, wow. and, and trying yeah, to this figure was, my way around it. So this is like early, early um, 90s. And uh, yeah, Chris was playing around with it. And um, essentially what happened was uh, he... <laughs> After he finished school, um, we, we actually, we, we lived in the States for a while and that sort of thing. But anyway, when we came back to South Africa, Chris didn't know what he wanted to do. Um, and uh, as most of the most interesting people in life don't yeah. quite know what they want to do when they <laughs> so get into their- Your dad was like, like, you're an architect. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so he sort of, he carried on working uh, for my dad's company, just mm -hmm. sort of doing um, 3D illustrations. And eventually he picked up some of his own clients and, um, actually turned it into a business. He went to go and work for a company doing their in-house illustrations. This was at a time when no one was, there was like two or three other people in the entire country doing it. So yeah. everyone was doing traditional hand-drawn illustrations. And so Chris, because he was an early uh, um, adopter of that technology, was able to get some really big clients. And then um, after doing it for uh, two or three years, uh, working for someone else, that I said, let's, let's, you know, let's start our own business. We I know Nick, we can do yeah. this together. Nick was working as a technology lecturer doing mm. um, as your, your, your media own, design, that yeah. sort of thing. And your yeah. Microsoft, uh, your yeah. M M MCSE and Nick, that's, uh, M4. That's old, right? yeah. Yeah, it's old. <laughs> old school yeah. MCSE. Yeah, yeah so I was like, I mean, we said over a cup of coffee, we just said, let's do something. Let, let us 
you know, sort of put together our own company and we can, um, you know, do it ourselves. And we started, think, the thing is that started small and yeah. yeah, I think because like I'm, I'm an artist and I've always just been an artist. So, I mean, I'll just sort of like, just put me in a corner and just plug me in and I'll just carry on doing things, yeah. but I'm not a business person and I'm not a producer. So I like, I'll, I'll carry on working until that I think it's done, but I need somebody to actually channel and direct me into a certain <laughs> thing. And that's where Nick definitely yeah. came I'm in. I'm good at telling people what to do. So yeah. that's a natural, <laughs> natural are you, fit. Are you the big yeah. brother then? Or? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so, that's a great um, dynamic. We, so you, you brothers came along yeah, well. Cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Chris, Chris uh, I sort of uh, boss him around. They, you know, big, <laughs> the big brother. Um, yeah, and so we, we, we ran a t an architectural company doing architectural illustration. And so um, I think that shows in, in our games that we, mm -hmm. we do. They're very environmental because that's the sort of where, what we know. You know, do what you know, and that's what we know. Um, and I think that's sort of the, the root origins is the, is the architectural stuff. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that, you know, that's what, that was my experience. I don't know if you saw my video where I was playing Beautiful Desolation, but, you know, just it just felt like so well designed you know i kept look even like the plants i kept thinking these it's like the gardener's <laughs> touch here i could see like a monty don coming in and being like oh look at this you know over here and over here i just felt like it was very you guys were very you, you put a lot of thought into like the the space yeah you know, around the player and what it's what the experience is is like going through that you know, environment. Yeah. You know, it's just probably a little bit of a tangent here, but I just, I was trying to think of other teams I know where it's brothers. And the one that comes to my mind is Cyan, you know, in the mist. Oh, yeah, it's brothers, in, yeah. in Riven. And I wonder if there's kind of a similar, because those games too are oh, very it's, environmental, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, even though their technology is nowhere near what you guys are, <laughs> you know, doing. It's basically slide shows. But anyway, uh, let's get into uh, Stasis then. And you uh, are going to talk a little bit about the your plans for the next stasis. So that's mm. let's go ahead and do this question here by Silver Black 007. Interesting name. Uh, he <laughs> wants to know how similar will Stasis Two be to Stasis One, and do you have a release date? And he also wants you to stay healthy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you oh, yeah okay so differences and then if you want to talk about the release. yeah yeah um you know so we let me talk a little bit about stasis and then because it, it's sort of like all of our games i think kind of um all lead quite organically onto each other even just from a, a design point of view for us um so we we started off doing doing stasis and stasis was very much done by just um myself so i did the programming the art, um, the writing, the sound design, and, and everything myself. And then Nick acted as a producer on it, essentially telling me what, uh, telling me all, all the things that I wasn't allowed to actually do. <laughs> things we could do that I've released it in 10 years. What kind of stuff <laughs> was he trying yeah, to do? If it wasn't for Nick, we, I'd, I'd still be plodding away on it. Um, but um, so, and then when, when we actually had the opportunity to do something together, we actually did um, a free game that we released called Kane, yep. uh, which um, we spent... I think about a year nine months or yeah, so, yeah yeah nine months a, a year or so on um Good. nine months you, for that one yeah. oh, that's interesting yeah yeah, yeah. And, and that sort of went in, in nine months from kind of like talking about the idea to actually releasing the game um which is a, a pretty good uh, sort of sort of spin. yeah. I mean, because Stasis took like five or five to six years we yeah. spent on that. So, wow. so the next game, we sort of needed to work out exactly how we were going. We'd worked together for more than ten years, but we'd never worked together on anything like this. So we sort of had to work out how our relationship would uh, flow and you yeah, know, the ebb and flow of what Chris would do and what I would do and how that would work together. Yeah. And that was that's where we sort of honed that on on game. Yeah. And then um, from there, we then went on to um, Desolation, where it was sort of like, um, I think technologically speaking, it was sort of leaps and bounds from where we, we started with Stasis, going on to K and then going on to, on to Desolation. Um, and then I think that if we, I'm sure we'll talk about Desolation later, but if we sort of going on to our next game, which is uh, Stasis Bone Totem, it really is taking a lot of the lessons that we learned from stasis with just sort of me working on this kind of like, you know, very low res little, little 2D game, all the way through to all of the design and technological things that we learned with Desolation. So things like 3D characters, 
particles, how to do the lighting mm. systems, and even just how to sort of like, how to structure a game um, in such a way that it's not going to fall apart. You know, mm. like stasis is stuck together with sticky tape and, and chewing gum. It really is. I, I actually, I opened up the file the other day and I was like, I have no idea how I actually made this thing. Um, yeah. And I think that we sort of like become better as a production studio going into stasis yeah. too. We've, we've also learned a lot. I mean, stasis was sort of a... And we didn't have a lot to compare it to at that point in time, that games that were from the same angle. We had Sanitarium. Um, obviously, we had the, the, the RPGs, but not an adventure game. Um, with, with Desolation, we tried to do sort of a, a hybrid RPG, very light RPG elements, things that we like from RPGs mixed with an adventure game. Some people liked it. Some people didn't like it. Yeah. I don't know. But with, sta with the new Stasis, um, we are um, going back to... It's, it's, it's very, very similar to Stace, the way yeah. it plays. Um, we're although the, we have we do have a, a cool twist yeah. to it, which we'll talk about no, no, as well. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're sort of taking the, the, the um, technological advancements that we made with Desolation and then kind of mashing them into the game design things that we mm. um, uh, uh, learned on Stasis. So it kind mm. of is definitely um, going to be the, 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 the best of all of those worlds kind of coming mm. together in, a, in our next in our next project. Your magnum opus. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Until the next one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds awesome. I was, uh, you know, I was telling you, I was playing Stasis a bit over the weekend, you know, the first one. I think it's on Steam for something like four or five bucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Insane deal. <laughs> but wow, I mean... You know, if that's what you consider to be like, what do you say, just stuck together with <laughs> tape? Yeah. And, uh, that's completely and... awesome to me. I, <laughs> I was uh, I really intrigued by that. I think somebody described it kind of as this almost psychological sort of lingering horror mm. uh, feeling that comes over as you, as you play that game. But yeah, yeah, that was, you know, we... uh, I mean, it's really something there, I think. We, we don't have um, sort of the access to the, uh, the resource budgets that, of, that bigger studios um, have. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it, with our tiny dev team, we need to work to our strengths. So, yeah. and also telling a story from a higher vantage point in terms of the higher angled camera is very difficult. Obviously a 3D game, you can see, you know, the emotion, the faces, you, you sort of, you can, the player can put themselves in there. So, we don't have that. We don't have that uh, ability to do that. So, because we're using a, a zoomed-out camera that's far away from the action, we need to focus on other things to ramp up the tension. So, sound, music, um, horrible situations, and sort of let the player's imagination work a little bit as well. Yeah. Um, which I think is a lot of classic uh, games. You know, did yeah. you know? You sort of. Uh, it almost show like don't tell yeah. almost. Um, it's the, the, the Hitchcockian thing of um, mm. it's it, it, it's not the what's it, it? It's not the bomb. It's not the bomb exploding. It's the bomb under the table that actually causes the tension. So mm. the entire thing with stasis was just the slow ramp up of sounds and sort of what's just behind the corner. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it really it's it was a, a challenge to actually do. But um, I, I think that uh, I was stupid enough to actually just. <laughs> Be convinced that I could do it, and I was like, "Yeah, of course I can. Of course we can do this. This is an isometric horror adventure game. Why not?" <laughs> yeah, I heard. Uh, I saw some people comparing it to Sanitarium. You know, that's the mm -hmm. one that comes up. I guess we could. It's just. What else might we say? Maybe Dark Seed or. Yes. Yeah. It's got that different like longest ego. journey, maybe. I... Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I guess yeah, it's, it's kind of a challenging format. This isometric. It, it is it is difficult it's um it has its benefits um but it also uh, as i said it takes you out of the action um a lot which uh um it makes it, it's much harder to 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 build a game um an emotive game uh with that sort of camera yeah. but um it does have benefits i mean you get to you see the environments and that a lot better than you would see in a 3d game um yeah i mean what one, one of the things that i think that it does do that um that other sort of uh, 3D horror games ca can't actually emulate is this idea of you're this this tiny character in this massive overwhelming world mm -hmm. and I think that when you're in a, a 3D first person game even a third person game um, it, it can be very difficult to show that sense of 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 uh, smallness that, that, that you actually mm -hmm. have and I think that that's something that we really tried to push with stasis was just this idea that John um, is just this little person that's sitting inside this massive 
cavernous story of an environment that's yeah. surrounding it. Yeah, that I think you succeeded there for sure. Uh, that's here's a question from Wade. This is a fun name, Wade D. McScurdy. <laughs> Wade <laughs> D. McScurdy. Uh, will the puzzles in Stasis Bone Totem be more grounded with their solutions, or am I grabbing another bug arm to solve some <laughs> puzzles? That, that sounds like fun. Uh, and then he's got a follow up question. Also, will Kane, we talked to you, mentioned that. Uh, mm. Also, will Kane stand alone? Or will that have an impact on Stasis 2? I think answer the first part, and then we can talk about the yeah. story of Stasis. You know, it's it's one of those, it's it's one of the eternal struggles, I think, of um, an adventure game developer. And I've actually I've seen these things where you sort of like there's one review and it says that the puzzles are too easy, and I just blew through this game. And then literally the next review is like the puzzles are obscure and I don't know what to actually do. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we are definitely trying to, with Bone Totem, we're going to try to make um, a more sort of like streamlined experience. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's not a game. It's not, um, you know, portal. It, it's, not, it's not like a, a, a puzzle game. So we definitely want to focus on um, story, environment, and the world. And sort of the puzzles are going to be the things that kind yeah. of like drive you through the story. E even more grounded in reality than, than um, they were in stasis. It, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult play uh, to do, you know. Um, you, want the, you want the puzzles to be interesting in that, but, you know, it's, it's a locked door and you need a key to get into it. How do you get that key? You, you, so it's, it's a difficult, um, you've got to make it interesting to, to do. But we've, we've learned a lot on the other games, mm -hmm. you know, especially um, on on Kane, uh, thing, puzzles that irritated the life out of people. And we sort of, um, we've read all the reviews and then we sort of boiled down what, you know, what focus and aspects of those yeah. puzzles irritated players. And then from there, we've, uh, we've, we've tried to, I, I think we, I think we will succeed yeah. um, in making the, the, play, the puzzles more obvious. And one of our beta testers now actually just messaged us and said, it's the first, he was testing out the, the, the demo that we're going to release soon. It's the first demo of us, uh, or first base of these tests for us that he actually didn't need help on it and uh, didn't need didn't really need to adjust anything on it. Yeah. So it was a great, great feather in our cap. We, we also want, the thing about game, with, especially adventure games, is it's a story. So we, we want people to finish the game. You know, it's, we, we, we don't have the luxury of, um, it, when, games were, when adventure games were made in the 90s, they were like 20 hours long because we have to, they were so obscure to buy an, a hint book or phone a hint line. Yeah. Um, I've heard they where, actually made uh, more money selling those hint books. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. They did on the exactly. Game so that kind of tells you all you need to know. Yeah. yeah. So we want we want people to. It's 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 a thin line to 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 tread to keep an adventure game interesting and keep momentum actually going, um, and uh, um, sort of like still have something that you want somebody to actually finish. But we've come up with some cool mechanics to yeah. hopefully give a bit of variety in in the actual game. Yeah. I think it worked out well. I was just thinking about the first stasis. You know, that's what I think. People that like adventure game puzzles, I think, are kind of like me. You know, you, you're reading it. You're like, oh, I'm stumped. I don't, I don't know what to do. Let me go back and look and see what kind of clues are in here. Oh, there's yeah. this little report about somebody getting killed with a crowbar. <laughs> it's just like sitting in your subconscious somewhere, right? And then you think, well, there's a morgue. Maybe I should go to that yeah. morgue and maybe the crowbar is still oh, there it's still God. there and then you, know, you just like <laughs> rush if i'm a genius you know <laughs> i mean that's why we play these games i, I almost wonder if you it, it's almost like you have to be frustrated occasionally yeah 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 to have any fun right if it's just so if it's too obvious then like you say you you lose yeah. that yeah it, it, it's sort of like an adventure game is plotted on a on a graph kind of do this and then they sort of do this, and then they sort yeah, of do this. Exactly. And I think that people are used to games just sort of like taking you up to this level yeah. and, and keeping you up there. I mean, even if you look at even like The Last of Us, um, which is a masterpiece, um, you know, a lot of it is walk up to this and press A, and then it will unlock this. You know, it's it's really um, it's sort of uh, they streamlined the process to the, the to take any. Um, frustration away frustration away from the player yeah but sometimes i think the older school old school players uh are sort of more um cognizant of that yeah. sort of uh <laughs> they kind frustration. of they enjoy the frustration a little bit yeah um, I've, i recently decided to i played um uh, commandos uh, um uh, the commandos 2 i think it's uh men of courage or behind enemy lines i can't remember which one it is mm -hmm. and that game is like 
frustration personified, but I love it. <laughs> I love it the point where like, you set everything up and then somebody dies and then you're in this situation and you could save scum, but I'm, I don't, I'm not a fan of save scumming. So I'm like, no, I got myself in a situation, I'm going to find a way out of it. Um, and I think that I quite enjoy that frustration of not quite knowing what to do. Um, and I think that's also something that we even tried to do in, in desolation was sort of like not hold people's hands too much and kind of mm. let them let them make their own mistakes and let them get frustrated because when you get to that point, part where you figure out what to do yeah. is that feeling of elation. Um, and it kind and of it's, it's a difficult role of the character too, because a lot of these yeah. a lot of these games, the character doesn't really know what to do either, right? So you're kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Them, putting them in the shoes. I, I think it works well. Uh, so what about Kane? Is that going to be its own thing? So will that, um, will that tie into Stasis too? Um, so the next game. Um, we're not, uh, the, the story's not going to uh, revolve around um, John Marachek, who was um, in the first one, or, or Hadley. Um, it's, it's, we're seeing Stasis as more sort of an anthology of stories set in the Stasis uh, universe, the cin Stasis cinematic universe. Yeah. Um, we're taking them to see you guys. <laughs> you guys have your own cinematic <laughs> universe. It's not, the same, <laughs> it's not the same characters, but it's characters that reference the same history. Um, it's, it's a new fresh set of characters in a new story mm. in the same world. So the same um, evil corporation is up to no good, um, but we're telling a different story. Um, and yeah, we, we might still visit um, uh, poor, uh, I, you haven't finished Stasis, so I don't want to ruin it for you. Have you finished Stasis? Uh, no, not, not quite. I just started yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So I don't want to ruin it for you. Um, I just got the but, tram. Uh, well, I, I got the, the just tram yeah. going across the screen, taking me to the next zone. And yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. I don't so, know how, how far along is that? Oh, that's a uh, yeah. You got you're still an early day. <laughs> still the yeah, yeah, <laughs> still in the far. intro. <laughs> you got a lot of mud and deaths ahead of you. <laughs> yeah. So we wanted to do something new, but um, we sort of uh, it's we've kind of modeled it after after Stasis, and um, you know we don't want to we don't want to rehash the same story again that we did, um, which was uh, um, told we really told that story. We've got a new story to tell. Mm. but uh the the visuals and everything are very thickly reminiscent of stasis more so beautiful desolation was um a lot sort of brighter and happier and um in the sunshine and and uh in sort of a, a apocalyptic <laughs> world yeah, exactly. yeah but um we're sort of looking we, we're going back to the dark ominous claustrophobic rain and uh, uh sort of all the all the uh the terrible things that we that we, we could do to these poor characters yeah <laughs> Yeah, they, you do do you do some pretty terrible things, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah, it's rough. Yeah, I guess you were. I mean, I guess a lot of games are pretty gory these days. You. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can have. It's not over gore. the top. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can have gore for gore's sake. That, that's very easy to do. Yeah, because, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's not just gore for yeah, gore's yeah. sake. It's it actually plays an important but, role. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, I think I think if you if you care about the characters and you care about um, what's happening and, and you want them to succeed, then it makes the um, the gore and sort of the violent scenarios much more. Um, I don't know. Uh, mean, mean, mean more. Mean more. Yeah, yeah. yeah they mean, mean more sort of to the player. Yeah. Um, and so so you know our games are about the, the, the world and that is the world and what's happening is secondary to the relationships and the characters. And we tell very simple relationship-based stories uh, we've done it on all of our games mm. um because that's sort of um that's the things that interest us you know sort of small emotive stories yeah. that uh that, that some that you can relate to on some level maybe not the scenario but you can relate to a, a father losing his uh, uh wife and daughter a uh, a lady who um uh, uh she's pregnant you know um uh, uh, uh people who have a child that they lose a child yeah, that's sort of Tragedy pe people can relate to. So um, those are the stories we like to tell. Yeah. Um, Some pretty serious topics there. For sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't and know any. I was trying to. I don't know any other game. Like, is there another game with the that has a pregnant main character? Uh, the, the the latest um, Amnesia. Amnesia, does it, yeah, yeah. Amnesia okay. Rebirth recently. They they've got a pregnant. Yeah. And then I believe that they uh, the guys who did Disco Elysium said that they were playing around with the idea of a pregnant protagonist for their next, um, uh, for, for, for the sequel. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I mean, that's obviously just hearsay. Yeah. Well, what else would you like to say about Stasis 2 then? 
you sure to cover it yeah so we some of the we're, um, we're, us in the previous one <laughs> we're, we're doing what we do you guys are excited what, about it we yeah. are we are we are um we uh we're going to be releasing a, a demo um of of the first part of the game so everybody will be able to play it um on steam uh and uh, yeah, so people will be able to sort of uh, give us some direction on whether they hate it or love it. And uh, I, I think they'll <laughs> enjoy it. Yeah, we, we've polished it up to um, uh, to sort of a release state. So it's not a buggy demo or anything. It's uh, we spent a lot of time on actually making it um, uh, as, as well. We've got voice. We don't have translation in it. That's the only thing we haven't, uh, it's, which is a very expensive exercise. We'll do that at the end of the process. Yeah. But um, I mean, so, we, something that we we have done with it in terms of the adventure game formula mm -hmm. is we we kind of um, in our, our actually all, all of our games you've played as one character actually moving through the story. And now what we decided to do was do something pretty much what Day of the Tentacle did, where you've got sort of three characters that you mm -hmm. can switch to at any time, um, and they almost got these kind of like um, they're working together as a team to get yeah. through this environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's something that it's given us a lot of variation in the puzzles and how the game yeah. is actually structured. So they can each, they can help each other. And so a puzzle can be solved by having someone do something here and someone needs something over here. They can do it over there and, and they get cut off, but they have access to um, something else or whatever the case may be. They also have a, sh they can share the inventory as well. They can share items. And then each character has a special skill that, um, that the, uh, that can affect and manipulate items in the inventory. So, um, Mac can, uh, he's very strong, so he, he's got a mechanical arm, so he can bend and break and smash things in the inventory as needed. Um, we have uh, 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 Charlie, who is a um, mechanical expert, so she can fix anything. And then we've got Moses, who is a uh, bear. He's a super toy uh, that uh, the, the player can um, control. And Moses can hack, um, hack things, so he can access computers and that sort of thing that the other players can't. He can um, also uh, access um, and reverse engineer items in the inventory that the other players can't. So we're sort of adding some, uh, we're sort of uh, adding some variation to the trial formula of walking around and just having one character and, and an inventory. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds great. I always like that day of the tentacle. Yeah, the way yeah, that they, it's a great game. But I mean, just the, I know what you're talking about. Being able to switch does add some spice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's something that like not not many adventure games. Um, uh, recently have 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 really done where they've been they've had these sort of like you know three separate characters almost telling their own story but still telling the same story um going forward and yeah. it's, it's something that we um we actually spoke about it years ago that this, this idea that we had of it's going to be two characters that were uh, in in different spaces um and then uh when we're talking about doing a, a sequel and we're talking about doing another game we just sort of were like that. That was a it was a cool idea back then. Um, let's see if we can actually do it now. Yeah. And yeah, it was, it's been a lot of fun to actually. There's a lot of technical um, and uh, uh, gameplay problems that it actually put up in, in our path, but we've managed to solve them. And it's it's yeah, it, it's really fun to actually play. Well, I'm sure you guys have heard this question many times. Mm -hmm. This is Silver Black again, Silver Black 007. But I got you know several people asking about this. You know, the, I think what happens they look at the isometric viewpoint and they're reminded of games like Planescape and mm. you know, Fallout's. You know, and, and they wonder why is this not an RPG? <laughs> 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 you know, so a lot of people would like to know: Are you considering adding more RPG elements, or maybe doing another <laughs> game in the future that's that's an RPG? You know, um, I think that uh, RPGs, just in terms of the resources that it takes to actually make an RPG, are huge. Uh, I mean, I think that the the the, the word count alone of um, Wasteland Two was like half a million words or something. I think that the I mean, the word count of uh, Cyberpunk is like eight million words. I mean, we've only got two people, so even <laughs> to even just sort of like write an RPG yeah. um, would be a massive challenge. Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, it's more like, I, I love the aesthetics of it. And we definitely experimented with uh, sort of a, a more kind of open world uh, gameplay um, uh, in, beautiful as, aspect, yeah. in Beautiful Desolation. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that, I mean, we've, we have spoken about it. Uh, I don't know if we'd ever do a fully fledged sort of like, D and D style, at least not by ourselves. Maybe if we ramp up in the in the future, yeah, um, yeah. I don't think it's possible. I think um, I, I, there's very few um, RPGs that have been made 
Oh, that that would um, require the level of um, graphics and uh, of, of resources and, and technical input that we could produce by a small team. Yeah. You need like ten or twenty people, experienced developers, to do it. And uh, the sort of the cost the cost to develop the games. You know, our games um, are costing a, a minuscule portion of those budgets. So. Um, you know, maybe maybe in the future, but I think for for us, it's uh, it's beyond what we're yeah. capable of doing it, just from a resource input uh, yeah. point of view. I think also yeah. the, the thing with us is that because our games look a lot higher budget than they actually are, it's something that's sort of like it it works in our favor in some ways, but it also can be quite a detriment. And that people like that, yeah, they'll, they'll look at the screenshots, they'll be like, why isn't this an RPG? Because it it looks like it should be. It looks like you, if you're producing this level of work that you obviously have a company of 50 people working for you, you know, this meanwhile, it's, it's Nick and I, you know, deciding we're going to be wearing pants during the day <laughs> kind of thing. Like we really are kind of like extreme micro, micro team. Um, so I mean, yeah. I'd, I'd love to work on it. I've got my list of dream games that I would love to actually do. And I would love to work on an RPG we, one day. But, we um, did work on, um, on, on Wasteland. Yeah, we did, that we did was work on, on awesome Wasteland 3, which was yeah, a lot yeah. of fun to do. And yeah. they also like dipping our toe into, yeah. that, into that world. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't in the main production, but that was in the early production of that game. And it was lovely. It was uh, really cool teams to work with. I mean, if you look at the size of those teams, they're huge. It's just like, you know, the credit, yeah, our credits roll sometimes. like that. These ones <laughs> yeah. are like, going for, for hours. Yeah, I remember thinking, was it Neverwinter Nights? I was talking to somebody about that, and she was her only job was to write descriptions for items. Yeah, like, you know, you think, yeah. wow, that's a big studio. <laughs> yeah, it, it, when when you actually look at just the 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 size of, a, of of an RPG, they they're monstrous. And even when it comes to just small things like um, testing, I think there was actually there was a, a Josh Sawyer GDC talk where he was talking about it, and it was something like to do one test run of Pillars of Eternity was taking a test to 16 hours. Wow. And now you've got to, if you think about yeah. it, you've got to do a build every day. So you have to have testers that are testing and submitting bug reports. And every single time that you make a change, you yeah. have to test the entire game. Um, so even from a testing point of view, I mean, Desolation was a, a challenge for us in that, in that I think a, a full run for us takes three to four hours, and then it takes nine hours to do a a proper test where you go through all the different variations. Yeah. Um, and we could do that because, you know, there's 12 hours in a day to actually work. So we could do a test and do bug reports, submit, and then do it again the next day. But when you start looking at doing 16, 20 hour tests, and you've only got two people actually working on yeah. something, even if you've got three or four people, it just becomes the other a thing is just a, task. The expenses of like translate, translation um, is about 20 cents a word. That's pretty much the average. 20 euro cents, 20 US cents, pretty much on par. So, um, you know, if you take, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you start extrapolating it to um, the millions uh, of words that you require on these games, if you wanted to feature in any other language other than English, it starts becoming quite a, quite a management. I mean, Desolation, which was, I think, 68,000 words, yeah. took the translation company three months to do. Wow. Um, so yeah. I, I can imagine um, how and that was Roboto, who's a, I mean, they're very thorough. They have QA teams and that's to do it really properly. Um, I can imagine Cyberpunk must, must take a year to, I think yeah. they're working on Cyberpunk, but they must have taken, must take years to, to actually translate. Um, so yeah, there's a huge amount of barriers to entry mm -hmm. for RPGs. They're just such massive games. I mean, you, I suppose you get simpler, uh, simpler RPGs, um, like the early 90s stuff, but even those teams, you know, you're still looking at like six to ten people on those on those projects, yeah. and those guys were obviously brilliant programmers and, and, and artists. So um, I think that's why people tend to maybe go towards the the ARPG thing, where you, you have sort of like less branching in your stories, mm -hmm. and they become more about um, uh, sort of like um, the mechanics of what you're actually doing. And then you mm -hmm. can do stuff like you can do early access, and you can actually get. A, uh, an amount of, of, of money coming in while you're actually still developing the, the game. Um, but to sort of, to develop a story-based game and do early access. Like pillars or something. Yeah, it's a huge you, amount of. Yeah, you, you yeah. can't really do it. It's, it's 
sort of like um, yeah, it's, feasible. It's beyond, I think it's beyond, um, I think a lot of people see sort of um, the technology like Unity and Unreal and, it, you know, they see the tools that are available um, uh, now, which are, fan are fantastic, don't get me wrong. They allow us to do things that we could never dream of. Um, but uh, you still, like there's still a raw input um, that human you need, cost. a human cost that you need to put into, um, into these uh, various games. And uh, yeah, RPGs are just exponential. Um, I think, uh, yeah, versus like, you know, most indies sort of do puzzle games because you can come up with a really cool little loop and then you can just extrapolate on that loop. Um, so that's sort of where, that's why indies sort of focus on, on those things. But, um, you know, even I, my hat's off even to the indies who do um, like Hyperlight Drifter and all those sort of uh, uh, fantastic, really large world indie games. It's, it's amazingly done. It, then they're difficult feats. And I think they're beyond our, if that answers yeah. your question, it's beyond our capabilities yeah. at the moment. Right now. <laughs> Yeah. You never know, though. Yeah, so we're not yeah. going to see, like, RPG is a stretch goal on. No. <laughs> That'd be like the, no, the $100 like million dollar stretch goal. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, well, I got some questions about just yeah. the adventure game genre. You know, because there are a lot of people that prefer this genre. You know, they, they don't not necessarily like it better, but it's just they, they see it as something different, and, and that's, that's good enough. Uh, so this is Matt Bradley Shergi again. What do adventure games provide that other genres do not? And then Shane Stacks had a follow-up to that question, which I think is kind of funny. Shane's known for this. Uh, what does point and click do for engagement with the brain's pleasure centers that other <laughs> games don't? And have you ever tried to turn things upside down and do a click and point? <laughs> um. I, I think sort of um, <clears throat> the thing that adventure games do that uh, other sort of genres don't do, I think is very much the focus on <clears throat> sort of characters and story being very much at the forefront. So, you know, some people would actually almost consider um, like walking simulators to be a form of, 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 of adventure game. Um, when you say uh, walking uh, simulator, uh, what, what do you mean by that? Is that... Well, the, sort of like um, uh, Gone Home and, and Dear Esther. So they're games where there's there's no sort of um, uh, puzzle uh, uh, interaction. There's just sort of you interacting with the world right. and then telling the story just through sort of like almost like single click interactions, reading a letter, mm. um, discovering the story uh, no through. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think that adventure games are quite unique in that they definitely put sort of story and character at the absolute forefront, sometimes to the detriment of gameplay. Uh, I think in adventure games, you kind of get to the point where you're like, I want to tell the story and I want to tell, uh, explore these characters. And if gameplay gets in the way, you nix out the gameplay before you nix out the story elements. There's a lot of other games, it's the opposite. It's sort of like focused on gameplay first. And if the story doesn't quite fit the gameplay, you adjust the story so that the gameplay is the thing that actually is, 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 is the the center focus of, of your production. Um, in, in terms of, of, of uh, pleasure centers, um, I think there's an entire subgenre on Steam that's actually focused on that. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. There literally is like this very, uh, these adult games, it's actually, it's quite fascinating. A lot of money you, in adults. Like in <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you have, have a look at, at Patreon, at the most funded um, most funded um, uh, developers or, or um, what do they what do they call them on Patreon? Anyway, pay, the, pay, the patrons fund the most money up. Yeah, um, it's it's adult games. Some of these games are raking in like thirty to fifty thousand dollars a month. Yeah. When I checked last, it's it's madness, yeah. and they are essentially point and click point and click games. It literally, they're actually. Um, almost like the old school. It's literally a rendered background, with normally a hand-drawn anime background, yeah. and you click and uh, you know you, you tell a, tell a very uh, uh, stories. So often they're like choose your own adventure type um, things, and so um, there literally is a uh, that's probably click and point, right? Yes, yeah, think. yeah. That would be the <laughs> click and point games. Click and point. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the games that you hide in your Steam library. <laughs> I don't think they're even on Steam, man. They're not allowed on Steam. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. They, uh, they, they, there were a whole lot of games that were banned on Steam, and there was big controversy. I'm not certain what actually happened with that. But um, it, 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 I think it, it does sort of go back to what we were talking about earlier with your frustration levels, where I think adventure games can kind of like do that thing where they frustrate you until you're not frustrated mm. anymore. And other games, they, I suppose, like, 
Dark Souls probably kind of like tapped into that idea of um, frustrating the player to the point where they just want to like throw their laptop away and then they get it. And then it's that feeling of like getting it and then you go down and then it sort of like holds that up again. Yeah, um, yeah so be, yeah. it's probably a better word, uh, you know, than frustration for it. I, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, some games are just basically just annoy you with it, right? And you're like, I don't, yeah. this is not even <laughs> worth messing with. Uh, whereas other games, it's like, okay, I'm stuck, but man, yeah. I'm going to get through this. You know, there's a, yes, yeah, it's worth it to me to figure this out. Yeah, you want sort of that send that endorphin hit from the sense of um, of success that, yeah. that that people get. You know, and that's uh, we sort of uh, try and build that in. You know, and you can get you, there's ways to do that. The characters can say yeah, and then you sort of unlock the next area, and the doors open up, and that you know that endorphin hit uh, sort of goes through yeah. that you've done something really fantastic, and the characters are happy in the scene. Yeah. Um, so just, yeah, just a recent example in my memory is in your game Stasis, where I was in the morgue and I'm. Like I need to melt the ice off of the those uh, whatever you call those things that come out of the wall, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and it like pops up a message is like you might want to get out of here, you know. <laughs> and, and I'm like, no, I'm standing right here because I want to see if these guys will actually no. kill. Oh yeah, they actually yeah. killed me. <laughs> yeah, we're, Yay! We're, we're <laughs> adding um, states, the new stasis is going to have deaths. Um, we've got deaths in, in even in the demos death, and we've got. Um, this is something you might not even know about in Stasis. There are suicides as well. You can use items on John and he will uh, use them. If you, I think it's three or four times you click on him with the item and he will kill, he will use the item on himself and it plays a whole, uh, there's whole yeah. cutscenes in that um, for that as well. So, uh, yeah, we, we sort of like revel a bit in the core. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that I was, mean, it would have been one thing if you had hit a game over screen and there's, you know, lose everything and back to square one yeah yeah that's you know, this right was pretty here. much okay you know you see this cool scene but then you're sure yeah, it's, just yeah. And... It, it's actually quite nice i think, yeah, I think that, it's um, a nice way to handle it games. yeah i think you know if we go back to sort of like the the sierra style games they're almost like um death is death isn't used as a punishment in adventure games but rather it's almost like a reward for exploring so i mean i remember trying to like find all the different ways that you could die yeah. in space five um, and I mean, they always said that that was really awesome um, death animations. And I think that, um, you know, compared to other games where death is, is uh, sort of a punishment. And I actually, I think it was, it was Prince of Persia that actually changed my sort of view on, on death in an adventure game or death in, in, in video games. Because it was this, you know, you would die, but then they actually built the mechanic about sort of like rewinding learning what to do, how to do something else differently, and then doing it again. So it actually was one of the first games that I could think of that really used death as a, um, not as a punishment, but as a reward for trying out different things. Let's see, Robbie, I'm curious what, how you guys will answer this. Where would you like to see the genre of adventure games go? Oof. Um, that's yeah it's 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 it is it is a hard one because it's i think that adventure games are, are very unique in that they're a genre that's very widely supported by um an amazing this first yeah, yeah because point, adventure adventure games are massive category yeah maybe point and click adventure yeah, games so yeah, specifically, yeah, right? yeah point and click adventure games i think that they're they're sort mm -hmm. of like they've got a um an amazing fan base that um are still hungry for them but they're games that can be made with very, very small teams of, of people. And I think that maybe if you if it got to the point where adventure games started to become mm. games that needed to be made by teams of 10, 20, 30 people, I think yeah. that they would lose a lot of what makes them really yeah. special. They, yeah. they, they tend to be, you've got a story that you want to tell, and this is the way that you can actually get yeah. it out. And the minute you start adding in the large sort of like budgets and everything the, the story could become watered down and, and people might not have the freedoms that they have to yeah I, like i don't think tell. stasis would ever have been made by a publisher then if chris had pitched the story to them they'd say you're out of your mind yeah gonna, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so uh um i think that uh i think that because adventure games are relatively i won't say easy but they're they're simpler to produce than um um well, point and click adventure games than um, than other games in the adventure genre. I think that the mechanics will relatively say the same. With our games, we've always tried to streamline them more and more and more and more. And I think I think we so, so for instance, um, 
just on on a side um let's talk about the, the, cur the cursor mm. and and you want to talk about that about and also how um y yeah um i mean I, yeah, yeah I, I think that um you know if you obviously look at the history of adventure games you go from sort of like text passes and then through to the um the lucas art style like you know you've got your your verbs and verb coins and that and that eventually kind of came down to just a single click of a uh, use interface um but you'd still have to sort of like click on an object to actually look at it or whatever it is. So we sort of went and simplified it even further where we actually have a, a, like a context sensitive cursor. So you just have to pull your cursor around the screen and then you get a description of what the character is actually looking at. But it's also essentially the same. It's just sort of like variations on- Just want to make it core, slicker as possible. Yeah. Keep maintaining that, core, that sort of core gameplay loop of clicking on an area, using an inventory item, uh, solving a puzzle. Yeah, I mean it's it's very basic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, I I think that um, it's almost like indie games are like tiny indie films. You know, if you had to go to like a um, a small little like like an indie film festival, that's kind of the the games that we're actually making as the equivalent. And if you take those those indie films and you suddenly gave them a massive Hollywood budget along with all of the, yeah, would they be any better? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good be, good analogy. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> you know, um, I think that uh, you always have to be realistic. I mean, in terms of this, uh, this is a business and we obviously need to make money. We just mm -hmm. plow all the money into the next game. But uh, <laughs> so we have to be able to make money to support ourselves, pay for the software and all the other resources and all the supporting people, you know, the voice artists and the translation and all that sort of thing. So we are running a business. So we have to be realistic. I mean, uh, we, we estimate the market for point and click adventures gamers at about half a million people. And, um, you know, of that, if you can sell to half a million, fantastic, but very few, very few games. I think yeah. um, Double Fine Adventure, they, they did half a million people, yeah. uh, units in the end, um, with their massive um, uh, budget and um, reach, reach uh, you know, and sort of obviously being the, the grandfathers of adventure games, they were able to do that. But uh, so, you know, that if, they, if they spent uh, $40 million on a game, which is Pretty much what a, I think an AA game is 40 to 100 million. That's what they're costing now. Um, they'll never make their money back. So I think that this specific genre will stay in the realm of indies uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, I mean, even if, if you sort of like as, as a cautionary tale, you'd probably take like Telltale Games where they sort of like did go into that adventure game market um, and they eventually got to that kind of critical mess where they couldn't actually continue the, the the budgets that they had for the games that they were making the the the, the um base that they were selling to just wasn't there yeah um, you know if you have half a million people of the half a million people only 10 percent of them might be people that buy a game every six months and of that 10 percent only half of those people will buy comedy games or horror games or they'll buy games yeah. from a certain developer so you kind of like you're taking like a piece of a piece of a piece of a pie yeah, so I don't think the markets are big enough to um, have the triple A budgets in that yet. Maybe it'll change. Maybe it'll become a really popular uh, genre in the future. But I think I, 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 I would be sad if it did, though, because like I said, I, I think that mm. it's. I think that it's a kind of a cottage industry right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and it, it, you, you've got like very unique voices that 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 come through and that tell tell the games that they. I mean, Wedged Eye is a, is a perfect example. Yeah, I've been thinking about the Dave Gilbert. Like, I had him on the show not too long ago. I mean, look at look at the Shiba. Like no, nobody would fund that game, but he was like, "This is a story that he wants to tell, and it was so personal to him." And he actually got it out, and it's it's just like mind blowing, in, in, incredible game. I mean, if, if you look at um, like Unavowed and those games, they they set in in um, New York. They, he like he he knows the space where they're actually set. He's got a personal connection with it, and I think that it's um it, it, if if the budgets got bigger, you would lose that connection yeah. because. Producers and that sort of thing, they need to have... Well, companies want their, to return. So yes, they want yeah. maximum impact. Yeah. They want maximum um, sort of uh, market penetration. And so that you're going to be uh, left with a sort of a distilled version of the story that you would want to tell. Unless yeah. you have a huge... If you've got notch money and you can make... And you can fund it yourself and yeah. money's on an object, maybe you could do it. I mean, I know they're talking now about quadruple... Uh, micro, is it Microsoft want to do a quadruple A game. So they're saying basically it's going to be not triple A, Quadruple A. Yeah. Essentially, I don't a know whole extra A is. on that game. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's <laughs> all the A's. Yeah. But essentially, what they're saying is that, you know, what they're going to be producing will be on like Hollywood blockbuster level. It's not going to be yeah. uh, attainable. So, and we're sitting there with like, 
you know, cell phone cameras trying to make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the equivalent of. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So to answer the question, we, uh, I don't think that the, I think the genre will just get slicker and more refined as the tools become mm -hmm. um, uh, more available than that. But I think it will, I think it will stay a small niche genre um, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. I like, that's a really good discussion, guys. I, I'm really, you know, the more I think about it. There's a question here from another one from Silver Black that I think kind of gets at some of what we're talking about. He had talked a little bit, well, he wasn't really a question. He was just saying that he thought it was, he liked the moral message uh, in stasis. And, you know, that's the sort of thing there where I think about adventure games that I've played. And I feel like as a genre, they probably had the most impact on me just in terms of uh, really a philosophical experience, you know, playing those games really making me yes, think about yeah. uh, issues. And uh, it's like a, Sort of like a really powerful novel, I guess, that you might read and you're still thinking yes, about it yeah. long afterwards. Uh, whereas these bigger, you might have a huge budget and everything's exploding everywhere, but that just doesn't, <laughs> you kind of forget about it. You know, just coming back yeah, to this movie yeah. analogy, right? As soon as you walk out of that Transformers movie, you're done with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not really thinking about it weeks and months later. So do you think adventure games are kind of have a unique... Uh, ability, I guess, to kind of take you deeper into moral territory. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I um, so we'll just sort of the the the, the moral implications of the the, the story of, of stasis. Um, uh, I, I've, I've I mean, if, if you look at the games that we make, you probably wouldn't be surprised that I'm kind of always fascinated by the the sort of like darker parts of of, of, of history. Um, and one of the things that um, has, has, has always sort of like, it's, it's one of those moral discussions in terms of like medical research. And you can you could frame it in terms of, um, you know, research on, on animals, you know, is, 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 at what point does it become moral or immoral to do medical research on, on animals? Um, and I think that's the thing is I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer for it. But so, I mean, something that was, um, uh, one of the more interesting um, ethical cases has to do with the research that's been done on hypothermia with people, where a lot of the research on hypothermia that we currently have comes from World War II, um, uh, obviously, um, uh, death camp experiments that have been done on people. Mm -hmm. And there's a big sort of discussion on, is it ethical to use that research? And on the one hand, it's like, if you use that research, are you saying that the methods that were used to get that research become acceptable? Are you saying that if you don't use that, did those people then sort of die for nothing? And it is, I don't know what the right answer is. And yeah, I don't I, know if there is a right answer. I think that's definitely somewhere where we draw the line in our games. Chris likes to ask like this really interesting question, um, which, uh, you know, sort of he pivots the game story. Mm -hmm. Chris does all the narrative and stuff. But we're very careful about taking a position on, on that over there. We rather yeah. present sort of the the uh, the world to the player and uh, the scenario and the background and that sort of thing, and then let them make a decision on it. We don't yeah. want to be preachy or sort of tell people what to think in that. So yeah. um, it's, it's a fine line yeah. to... It's interesting to take those questions that don't necessarily have a right or wrong answer yeah. and could yeah. be argued sort of either what's way. A, what's, a, uh, what's the problem? Um, what do they call it? Uh, uh, trolley, what's the yeah, yeah, trolley yeah, problems? yeah. It, it's, it's trolley issues. Yeah, I mean, trolley, yeah, problems. Yeah, tro trolley problems. I mean, that's sort of the you know, do you do you divert the trolley to kill a, a bus of children or to kill one person? Like, well, you know, what what is the moral implications yeah. of of that? So we ask the moral question, but we don't necessarily answer it. Yeah, and I think that's that also lets people. I think that's also sort of a, a key um, in writing to make people linger with that question and sort of uh, you know. Um, Think about that. I think yeah. that's when people are, are given sort of the moral questions and they themselves need to think back to it. Um, I think that's a lot more powerful than telling them this is what the answer is and this is the way yeah. you have to think. And those are the things that have probably stuck with you over the years, yeah. the games that you actually play. It's like, well, you know, it, it, think you, you feel a bit uncomfortable at, at certain points yeah. when you're experiencing a story. And like that's, yeah. not, that's not, not a bad feeling to actually have. Yeah, this kind of gets to, I think, at this idea of where, where would we like to see adventure games go? Because, I mean, the stuff we're talking about, I think you could say it's fascinating, it's it's interesting. But we're using words like troubling and it's like disturbing. Yeah. Not exactly <laughs> fun, you know. <laughs> Nobody does this stuff for enjoyment. 
But, you know, very yeah, here's something you could do that. with an adventure game and a small team and a budget. You know, you get into these things, but like you said, a, a major publisher, they'd be like, how's that fun? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, if you look at um, uh, Daedalic, who do like Deponia and all those things, they actually um, worked with us in publishing stasis uh, originally. And uh, their games are quite, um, there's a lot of levity and sort of uh, uh, fun and sort of, uh, they're way more old school than our games. Yeah. Um, uh, but they have a huge market. You know, that's, Daedalic's a massive company. I yeah. think it's like 100 people who work just on adventure games there. Yeah. So, so there is sort of a, uh, once again, Chris mentioned it earlier, there's a uh, sub- uh, sub genres in the genre yeah. of point of view. You get people who sort of want the more realistic horror space sci fi thing. Um, and you get people who want sort of the levity, happier yeah. games. Although I don't know how far those take the genre, yeah. but they do give people, they do fulfill a need and uh, yeah. fulfill a niche. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm quite happy that not everybody's making games that are dour and depressing. But, yeah. but we just like making games that are dour and depressing. Yeah. <laughs> it's working through our own angst yeah. and getting it on the screen. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating just as a genre. I always think that. It's interesting when you go to some place like Walmart, which is the big sort of. Yeah, you know, do you know about Walmarts? Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> okay. No, no. Uh, but you go to like the, the PC gaming section, and literally the only games that I have there, you know, maybe like one AAA game, and like everything else would be like adventure games from the, uh, <laughs> the adventure games company. Yes. <laughs> you know, this yeah, stuff, I mean, you pick up a lot of. Games. Who, who um, I look up until a couple of years ago, they were doing massive box sales. Stasis sold yeah. thousands of units in, in box retail. So um, I think I, th I think that's kind of dead these days. I think that's on its way out, if mm. if if not just for collectible sake. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the adventure game guys were, especially the hundred and one games on one disc. Those were yes. very popular. <laughs> Yeah, it's somewhere where the, uh, the those hidden object games are just yeah, yeah. people have no idea how big that market is. Oh, it's enormous, it's huge. We actually it's looked at doing a hidden object game once. Stasis, yeah. the hidden object game. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you look at uh, at uh, other massive genres that people don't really think about, are the clicker, the clicker, um, the flappy birds. No, 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 oh. the clicker where you click on. It's literally called that the cookie, cl genre. the cookie clicker, you click and all. And you get bonuses in it, but that. I think that sort of taps into the gambling um, psychology uh, aspect um, mm. quite a bit. But uh, yeah, if you want to make money, uh, I don't, don't go into adventure games. Go into some, some another yeah. genre. <laughs> adventure games take a long time yeah. to make. <laughs> a long time to make. <laughs> well, we, talk, we talked a lot about stasis. I do want to talk some more about Beautiful Desolation. Mm, yeah. You know, this is a game that's come up in several of my recent interviews. And uh, I think Brian Fargo talked about it. Yes, you know quite a bit is, is how impressed he was, and I mean I think anybody would be impressed with the with the art in this game, and you know the architecture. You know now, now that we talked about that a little bit, it sort of makes sense how it's so well well laid out. Uh, but yeah, what you know what do you want to say about beautiful desolation? This was you'd had some experience at this point, right? And yeah, you're yeah. able to apply <laughs> some lessons, and I think um, beautiful desolation. Um, I think I got a bit of PTSD. When I when I think back on it, um, it, it was it was something that because it was it was sort of like further away from our our wheelhouse than I actually thought we were capable of, of doing. It's the kind of thing where I think if we presented what the final game was to us when we first started talking about it, I would have been like, "There's no ways we can do this." I mean, I think it's got something like it's like a hundred environments. I don't know yeah. how many. Yeah, like a hundred uh, massive environments, uh, forty characters. All fully voiced. Um, I think it's like sixty-eight thousand words. Yeah, all fully voiced. Thousand as well. words. All, all, all voice. Yeah. Branching storylines. Um, and I sort of uh, I multiple went, endings. Yeah, multiple <laughs> endings. And I went. Um, I probably went a little bit sort of like too in depth. I mean, I literally I created conlangs for all the different. Wow. Stories. Really, um, and I, they've, they've each got their own writing system and font and font that I actually <laughs> yeah. like developed their, their individual writing yeah. systems, um, and I think I sort of like uh, I, I went probably a little bit too far <laughs> into the world yeah. building aspect of that it. That is just really interesting about, about the conlangs. I I don't want to take tear off on too much of a tangent, but that's just fascinating to me now that you you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. I always think about how uh, that's one of my academic interests. Actually, is conlangs. Okay. We've got a little group we write about uh, conlangs and the expanse and 
uh, for a you, uh, Star so Trek and yeah, Avatar. but Delta's language is absolutely fantastic. It's 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 beautiful to even hear them actually speak us. It's, it's well, here's a question for you about Cunlings then, because uh, what we've been arguing basically is these are it's important. It's an important part of the world that these mm. authors are building that people underestimate. So, what do you think about it? Do you think it plays? I mean, why create a conlang for a game? And what, what do you think it adds? Um, I, I think I did it because I'm stupid. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, you know, I think that, um, you know, so much of society is actually built around language. And it's actually something, so I don't know if you've been watching the latest Star Trek Discovery, um, but there's this one part in episode three where he swears. And it's this one thing that just feels so out of place because it's supposed to be set 900 years in the future from where they were. And if I had to go back in time just with us, sort of you 100, know, years. 100 years or 200 years, the, the language would be completely different. Um, there's actually, uh, I think it was um, Deadwood. Uh, when they did, yeah, Deadwood um, is quite well, I don't know if you know the, the series Deadwood. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, and it's quite well known just for the, the amount of like swearing that it actually has. And apparently they filmed the pilot with sort of like realistic dialogue. At period time. specific, yeah. yeah. Period specific cuss words and swear words and that and the people that they showed it to were laughing because they couldn't understand why these you know you tell somebody to go to hell now it's sort of like whatever but you know back in the 1800s telling to go to hell was like probably one of the worst things you could yeah. actually say to them or call it a scallywag yes you know, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Of, it, it insults oh your mother yeah the end of it you know <laughs> and i think that there's sort of like if, if you don't take the development of language into account when you're doing world building um, I think that you, you, you won't take everything else in, into account. And I think it's one of those things that um, it can unify people and it can also sort of like push people apart. Um, you know, if you want to sort of uh, fragment a society, like take away their common tongue. Um, yeah. And it, it's something that I, I think it, if, if it, you're building a world where you want to fragment a society, make sure people can in, speak in fact, languages. In fact, uh, sort of a real world example of that is, um, you know, we sort of try and write from what we know. We kind of try and pull on our own country's uh, history. Mm. And uh, the, the, essentially the end of apartheid in South Africa, which uh, ended in the early 90s, officially in 94, but early 90s when Nelson Mandela was uh, released, 90. But uh, that, the, the dominoes that fell started in 1976 uh, when the apartheid government tried to force um, everybody in the country to speak, especially in the, in the, the townships where um, predominantly black people live to speak Afrikaans as a primary and not a secondary uh, language. Mm -hmm. And that um, the forcing of language and sort of trying to force them to abandon the other language literally caused the, um, the, the massive the riots and uh, of, of problem, that government. Yeah, which essentially set the dominoes in motion and, out, and pushed the buttons that eventually ended apartheid, mm -hmm. um, among other things. But that was one of the sort of the major things. So, so language is massively powerful. I mean, in, in, in our country, we have uh, many, many official languages. Uh, oh. Yeah, even, yeah, we have a huge amount of language. So language is sort of something that's pervasive in every part of our life. So um, it, I think you, your question was, why, why did Chris do that? And I think it's because of the amount of language that we are exposed to over here yeah. and the importance of it. Um, and it's also, um, there, there's a, it's quite funny, there's a, a part on, on District 9, which is obviously set in, in Johannesburg, and it's, I think it actually came up as like a, um, uh, a, an error on the IMDB board, which is where Christopher Johnson, the, the alien, can speak to Vickers, and he speaks in his alien language, and then Vickers replies in English. And it's actually a strange thing because it's a very South African thing where even I went to the shops today and um, I had somebody say hello to me in one language, um, and I said hello back in, in a English. Language. And then when I went to the cashier, they said something to me in one language. I replied to them in another language. <laughs> and everybody sort of like understands each other. Yeah. So language is a very central part of South African life. And that we all have our own languages, but we can generally understand and pick up on what other people are actually saying. Um, and I think it's something that's, um, I think that language is extremely important when it comes to world building. I think that it's actually, it's something that if you could take that as your core, and you could actually build an entire history of a civilization if you just understand why the language exists and what it's actually saying. Mm -hmm. And the expanse is, of course, like the, the, the prime current example of, of that. Wow. 
it's fascinating stuff. Sorry, we just rambled on there. Everybody's <laughs> loving this. Uh, uh, let's take it to um, coming back to Beautiful Desolation. I guess we haven't really left that topic, but we sort of got at the conlangs, but yeah, yeah. I wanted to get a little bit more too into the well, the beautiful part of it, right? And the, and the artwork and the design yeah. of these areas. And you know, Dark Osric had asked about why some of those areas he, he says they were, he feels like they were cut off. So I almost thought I saw it a little differently. Some of those, I think I know what he's talking about. I can sort of see stuff off in the Oh, okay. In the corner. But he might also be thinking about some areas, I guess, that were not, or that were planned that didn't I, I, yeah, I, might, uh, I, I, come I, out. I'm not I, quite sure the context I think here. Talking, I could, he, he's actually sent me a message on, on Twitter before about it. Um, so when, when we first, um, when we did our, our Kickstarter, we had some, uh, a couple of areas that we displayed uh, in the Kickstarter oh, that didn't make it into the, into the final game. Um, and I think that's just a part of, kind of game production yeah game development. Uh, yeah just, just areas get cut uh things get changed i think it it, um, it can almost be like a, a detriment of crowdfunding in that you sort of like you, you show, show your cards yeah, very early you then, show your yeah. cards very very early in what you're actually in, in what you're doing and the amount of content that gets cut from games i think um like game players would 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 be disgusted at the amount of stuff that just like gets pushed to a certain point and then just goes on the yeah. room floor yeah yeah yeah, yeah. to sort of uh you know maybe make may, maybe the story needs to make more sense and that sort of thing i mean yeah we cut out a couple of areas in desolation um it also um uh in stasis there was a whole chapter cut out um yeah. mainly just to time we just didn't have the time for another year to spend on it um but everything was written and all the backgrounds are rendered and that but it just didn't work we we just couldn't yeah. we didn't have the uh the yeah. the that, that was one of those decisions where the producer takes yeah. over and I'm yeah, sitting going, no, the we've been just in and Nick's going, yeah. there's big red marks in the script saying, cut it out, yeah. <laughs> slice it out. Yeah, well, that's one of the things it. Fargo talks a lot about is just that role of the producer. That's why it's so important because, you know, otherwise yeah. Yeah. you'd never see the game, right? It's yeah. probably the most important one of... I like to think so. It probably is the most important one <laughs> yeah, of... Like of, of <laughs> without producers, games wouldn't get made. Yeah, that's the honest truth. Is that they just wouldn't get made. Yeah, to answer your original question about the beautiful part, w when we made the game, we wanted to um, we wanted to focus on uh, something that hadn't necessarily been seen before. We wanted to do a post-apocalyptic game, and we thought, what better place to? At that point, we were actually living on the beach. Uh, we, we were about five minutes from the beach now, but we were living literally on the beach, and we thought, wouldn't this be a magnificent place to to set a game? Um, but uh, in a post-apocalyptic post setting, no one's really done an African post-apocalyptic setting. Yeah. You know? It's normally New York or, I don't know, Chicago or, you know, the uh, the East Coast or the West yeah. Coast. America keeps States. getting so, blown up. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, or you, yeah, or it's exactly. Ru Russians obviously like the post-apocalyptic side yeah. as well. Um, Stalker and that sort of thing. But uh, so we, uh, we said, let's, let's set it over here. No one's done that before. And we sort of have a really interesting uh, flora and fauna that we can kind of integrate and, and tell an interesting story uh, with. So we, um, yeah, so we sort of drew quite a lot of inspiration. We, we used a lot of photo scans um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the renders, which uh, is essentially um, a technology where Chris takes like, like a thousand photos or 150 photos or so, depending on how big the object is, mm. literally takes photos around it. And then we have a software application that rebuilds that into a 3D object and textures it. So we literally have pieces of Africa in the scenes. And I think, wow. it's, I think it does sort of uh, make the areas more interesting than they would have yeah. been if we just use a stock standard rock, you know, or a bit of terrain. Um, more than just the... Uh, the, the standard yeah. stuff. So all of the uh, all the seaweed in the very very first part where Brock actually lands was actually the first stuff that we scanned on that beach where we used to go for walks in the morning. And the one time I went and I took my camera and we would walk around for an hour, an hour and a half, and find interesting pieces of seaweed and then go and do three D scans. Of and they make them really big in the sea. Yeah, yeah. And so take they... them. Yeah, to go from three meters to <laughs> fifty meters yeah. and build up the scenes that way. So I think it's actually it is every. Every scene in the game has something that's been 3D scanned from 
the areas I, around us. I don't know. I, I, you obviously spoke to the guy who asked the question, but um, I don't know if the question was also directed at... Uh, so obviously in Destination, we have a whole series of maps that connect the areas together. And when you fly over areas, you kind of wish you could go and visit them. But um, obviously uh, we, we, we'd love to have visited all the areas, but we couldn't. But we did that on purpose. We wanted to make it that you fly over the city and you, because you can land in another part of the city, you imagine that you could plus, if you really wanted to, you could land at this part of the city. Yeah. And that was all sort of part of the, making the game seem bigger than it really was. Yeah. I mean, like Chris said, it's about a hundred, really big screens, but that's only a hundred big screens. Um, I think Pillars, uh, Pillars 2 was like 150. Yeah. Uh, Pillars, yeah, so, or Pillars 1 was 150. So, yeah, so you sort of have to make your games uh, feel bigger than they really are. So there's little tricks that we do there. That's clever. You're just processing that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is, yeah, that's a good sign, I guess, if you feel like, wow, this world is so interesting. I wish I could explore more of it. Yeah, yeah that, that's a pretty good place to to be. Uh, well, we talked a little bit about Kickstarters here, and I know you guys have had some experience running these, and I guess about uh, more to come, you know, sounds like, and maybe lessons learned along the way. Uh, so, yeah, do you want to get into that? Yeah, so... Um, whole crowdfunding so, phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so um, what happened was... Um, to sort of cut a long story short, um, we were running our other business and Chris was developing Stasis uh, on the side as a hobby project. And he had developed quite a following, um, this is like pre-Twitter days, I think it was on pre-Twitter. Yeah, I think Twitter's like just started. Yeah, this. but it was it was mainly people coming to a sign up on a newsletter and sort of, uh, I think what was it, 2007. Yeah. Personal forums and that sort of thing. And a lot of people were following the game and you know really looking forward to um, Chris uh, releasing something and uh, it got to the point where Chris uh, we were, we were for, for various reasons um, our business was doing uh, really well but we were, we were really really swamped Chris had this game on the side and we said at some point if we wanted to do the game development now Chris and I have been making things and uh, working together like that since we were small kids um, we made board games together yeah, and, and we've been making computer games that have never been released for yeah, just yes. messing around and Brilliant. stuff, and you know, no, nothing into our adult life. But we always spoke about it, and we, Chris said, if if we could make, if we could prove that Stasis could work and people would pay for it, you know, is it something that that I would look at actually doing full time? And I said, yeah. So at that time, Kickstart uh, had uh, just had the Double Fine um, uh, project, which obviously blew up Kickstarter, and everyone was launching on Kickstarter, and it's a huge thing. So we thought, let's put together a campaign. We'll put together a small demo um, of the game, which actually is up to the point where you are now. We're by the tram there. Yeah. And we'll see, you know, do people want this? Is this something that's actually, this vertical slice of the game, is this viable for us to then spend, um, you know, another two years on? And uh, yeah, we, so we released the, we did the Kickstarter and um, it was successful. We funded it. And then Chris then spent... Um, another year or so, months, yeah, yeah, a year and a half. Yeah. Um, it's very traumatic. I've blocked it all out of my memory. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> on uh, finishing off the game while we both worked, still at the business, still worked at the company. And uh, yeah, after we released, we realized that it is something that could supplement our income and we can we can do it um, on a full-time basis. And yeah, so we... And also we, gave us full artistic freedom, yeah. which is something that we, we weren't really... Uh, yeah, experiencing we in were, our we we're a commercial artist we we're commercial artists so we were doing other people's art you know we were do, we, we did it really well and we we're doing lots of we had lots of really big clients and we we're doing hundreds of images but it, we had what happens is that um the, the more successful you get the less when chris and i first started it was just him and i and we, were, we did a lot we had a lot of creative input but after a while it was sort of just a machine you know clients would give us the work the staff would get on the work and we'd output the image yeah. at the end. It was you become the, a manager of people rather than yeah. Yes, and yeah. Which is one of the reasons Chris started doing Stasis. There's sort of a release valve, um, as he calls it, to sort yeah. of uh, uh, do something creative. So and not, you know, it's like, not kill my clients. So. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's why it's such a dark game. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can feel so, the frustration channeled in there. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean that's sort of the and then yeah the crowdfunding and then we did it again um, for Beautiful Desolation and uh, yeah so we'll um, we'll see so, what yeah, happens with the next project. I mean crowdfunding was really quite amazing for us and that it gave us some um, this incredible built-in audience of people mm -hmm. who had our backs because they they 
put money into the game and they'd commit it. And it was, it was more than just people who were like fans on a forum. It was people that actually believed in what we were actually doing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And in, in that way, it's, um, you know, like, I mean, like making games is hard, but finishing games is harder. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost this thing where, when you, when you crowdfund, you don't have a choice. Like you, yeah. you have to finish. You're accountable yes, to the yeah. to the backers. Well, that's how we saw it. And we, that's how we still see it. <laughs> say, yeah. uh, that's the right that's, attitude yeah. to have of it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's been a lot of uh, uh, crowd uh, funding where they've uh, let down the backers. Yeah. And that's actually pretty much, uh, I would say, killed the, 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 the crowdfunding industry. Yeah. There's a couple of gems that pop through every now and again. But um, it killed the momentum of the crowdfunding yeah. industry. So um, we sort of, uh, yeah, so uh, we sort of looked at it from a, point of view of uh, our backers hold us accountable yeah. they ob obviously we can then use the money to um do the project but also we can we, we've used it as a uh a, a weather vane to see you know is there interest in making this game before we commit thousands of hours of our own time yeah. and money and resources if other people are prepared to put some money up well then you know they, maybe there That's is a market right. for it um, yeah i mean i i find um people that sort of back kickstarters and that that uh back people on Patreon and stuff. I, I find it amazing. It's, it's incredible that there's people that are out there that are willing to support artists in creating art. And that's, I mean, that's really what it is. It's, you're supporting independent artists who are making something. Yeah. Um, and it's, 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 it's a unique thing. And it's an amazing experience to know that you've actually got those people behind you that are willing to actually um, put their hard earned money on the table and be like, yeah, we, we trust that you can do this, you yeah. know? Um, and then that's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it is, it is the sort of Damocles kind of like hanging over your head. And it's like, it, it makes you work that extra two hours a day, you know, <laughs> you get to hour eight and you're like, nah, I can, I can do another, another two or three, you know, to, to, to get this done. But it's an amazing feeling um, to actually know that you've got that sort of backing and that kind of support. It's just, a, it's a great way to put it all. And you know, just thinking how it's, it's kind of inspiring in a way that's the confidence that people put in you and, yeah, it's actually a little bit of, a little bit of motivation. Yeah. That yeah. Maybe terrifying. <laughs> uh, let's see. So we've got a, uh, just a few last questions here. Hmm. Uh, guys, this is Matt Workler. We kind of talked about this a little bit, but he specifically wanted to zero in on this idea of the making a fully playable demo, mm -hmm. you know, part of the part of the pitch. And he, he says that's reminiscent of the old shareware days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's driving this recent, yeah. Moment, but yeah, um, I'd like to get your take on on that aspect I, of this. I think it's imperative for, uh, especially for new developers. Um, I would not launch a Kickstarter, although um, we 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 Desolation didn't have um, a vertical slice demo uh, because we had already proven ourselves. Or, or, and we did Kane. Uh, yeah, with yeah. with Stasis, and we released Kane as a free game to all of the backers. So we already shown what we were capable, but I think that it's an imperative to show a vertical slice on what uh, you are capable of um, and what uh, what type of game you're trying to. Have. It's it's very rare. Not a lot of games uh, or not a lot of games devs um, do it. I mean, at one point everyone was doing it, but a lot of guys aren't doing it now. Yeah. I'm not sure why. Um, but I think it's um, I think it's important to show um, show developers fish uh, so show. Um, backers now, especially considering it's, it's really hard to get noticed. So if you can get some momentum going with your demo, get some likes on your Steam page, that sort of thing, yeah. I think it, 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 it builds that, it starts that slow marketing uh, build through to the end. And it, yeah, it is, I mean, we grew up with Sherry, so yeah. yeah. We didn't ever buy any Sherry, we just used to play the free demo. Like, yeah, I used to get, those, get free... those demo discs yeah. <laughs> with 600 Sherry games. Yeah. Uh, I think I played the, the the first level of Quake like a hundred times. Yeah, as it and came on a PC game. Or... Yeah. <laughs> what's that other one uh, by Cry Cry Team? Um, it, it, it's Cry Which, Team's first game. The Far Cry. The first no, game. no, no the, before Far Cry. I can't recall. Anyway, I'm showing you Asia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we played those games uh, endlessly. But uh, yeah, so I think it is um, an important to show what mm. you sort of are capable of, what the game's going to be like. And I think uh, it's an imperative yeah. as, for new developers, definitely. I think it's, it's also, um, you know, with, with game development, like the, the first 90% is hard and the last 90% is also hard. Yeah. So it's the kind of thing where like finishing a game 
is extremely difficult. And just, I mean, there's things like getting your save game system to work and getting your menus to work. And yeah. the, those sort of like the wrapping that goes beyond just the content that you're actually making, everything else. And those things can take a, a, a lot more time yeah. than you may actually you think it's going to take. a month on the main menu. Yeah. You know? And that, that sort of... Uh, so I think um, yeah. See, I appreciate right. those little details, though. I mean, like you know, <laughs> if you watch the video, I like talk for a while about it. just look at this main menu. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, this is not a generic can, menu. Yeah, <laughs> if you can, uh, to, so to build those various systems and that, if you're doing a vertical slice, it essentially forces you to think about those things at um, that point. It might be buggy as hell, but at least you can uh, focus on, it. especially if you're an, if you're a new developer. I think. I wouldn't even dream if, if we didn't have an existing product. And we currently have an existing product and we're still releasing a vertical slice demo. It also yeah. allows us great feedback, you know, I in terms have of- I to ask, what, what, do you, what is vertical slice demo? Oh, sure. So a vertical slice is almost like, if you think of the game as a cake, you've cut a slice through the game and you, you don't have all the other content, but you've got a fully playable section of the game yeah. um, that you can then, uh, Iterate yeah. on. So yeah, yeah. The, the idea would be so, that if you've got this part of the game, um, so an example would be like you've got um, an, an RPG. So a vertical slice of an RPG might be you've got a single room with a door and a chest, and you can basically use all of your skills to basically open that door and get into that chest, and maybe you can like find a single party member to actually join you, and that would be the, every, it's basically every system an illustration the of the play loop yes, of all yeah. systems in the game. Obviously, you can take that vertical slice even further and add like a save and a load mechanic and a menu and that sort of thing. But essentially will give people a good idea of what the gameplay will entail. It doesn't necessarily have to have all of the content that you're going to, yeah. to add in. But uh, vertical slices are usually um, internal production um, and we would call it a, a demo. So production, people who are making the game would call it a vertical slice and they'll do everything they can to get that vertical slice done. And we're just taking it one step further and actually releasing that vertical slice as our demo. as our demo of the game that we're going to make and we yeah. hope people um respond respond to it and want to see more and want to see it finished so yeah yeah i've heard different terms for, you know thrown around sometimes like proof of concept and yeah exactly uh, prototyping and all this and it kind of goes over yeah exactly <laughs> what you're just saying makes a lot of sense to me it's kind of like look here's, we've shown what we can do yeah generally it all works <laughs> generally the prototype um and that those might contain less um, less systems than the vertical slice. The vertical slice normally has most of the main features that you want to display to the um, the player. So, whereas you know, if you build a prototype, a lot of the game jams guys will go to the game jam and do a 24 hour or 48 hour or a weekend or whatever, and produce like a really cool little prototype Single concept mechanic, mechanic yeah. game that sort of. But a vertical slice generally um, will have a bit more playability, but it's, uh, yeah, this is just a uh, minutiae yeah. of the definition. I think Essentially, you're right. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a shifting definition depending on who's actually yeah. saying it. But for us, it, it, Vertical Slice is a playable portion of the game, essentially like the first chapter of the game. Yeah. With, with all systems working that people can experience and see what we have to offer. Um, we were lucky in that we, um, we were able to adapt uh, the beautiful desolation framework that we wrote um, uh, to this uh, new game. So um, because we're still using a isometric camera and we're still uh, using pre-rendered backgrounds of 3D characters, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. We didn't have to redo the save system and the load system and that. We just, it's basically a reskin of the menu and that. And it's essentially just a change of functionality that actually happens in the scenes themselves. Yeah. Um, so it saved us a lot of time um, to, to produce. It sounds like you guys are in favor of the idea. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Is there any reason yeah. not to include one? I mean, um, I can't. I can't think if, of. If of, you're not confident in what you're doing, then probably <laughs> you probably shouldn't be on Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, you know, vertical slice is great uh, to, uh, as part of the your pitch deck to get funding. If you want to, if you if you even want to go through sort of traditional uh, funding, like a publisher or whatever, they'll generally require some level of vertical slice and depending on the publisher they would want a different level of polish some might just want to see the mechanic um if it's sort of a uh like king or one of the mobile games but if, if it's more sort of a pc uh or um console game they generally want to see a relatively polished portion of the game 
that mm-hmm. sort of demonstrates not only the mechanic, but your capabilities yeah. of producing a, an, in, an end product. I, I think mm-hmm. it's also really important for developer because oftentimes like you don't know how long something is actually going to take you. So I think that um, mm-hmm. artists are notoriously bad at estimating how long something will take. And I think especially in game development, like you, you know, the, the, the thing is sort of like um, double your budget and triple your time is how long it will take to actually do something. Um, so you might see like, you know, oh, I, I think that we can knock this single level out in a month and it actually takes you three months. So that over there will adjust if you're going for funding. Suddenly you can't ask for this amount of money. You have to ask for that amount of money because you have a better idea of how long it will actually take you to produce something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, I think that artists are, are bad at estimating our own time. And I've, I've put programmers and all game developers in that same category of artists. Something that would you, you think will take you an hour will take you three days and something that you think will take you a week you can get done in an afternoon. It's just so difficult to actually tell. But if you've got a vertical slice, you, have, you will generally have a pretty decent idea of how you can take your core idea and roll it out to the rest of production. All right, so I've got one last question Ooh. here, or topic. Uh, we sort of talked about this a little bit already, but you know, this work that you've done with Brian Fargo in Exile on, on Wasteland 3, and I I used your toaster. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what, what kind of relationship do you, do you guys have? Are you, is that something that's going to continue or, or what? Yeah, I hope so. Well, if Brian's yeah. watching this, yes. <laughs> um, you know, so that, that was actually quite a, quite a fun thing. Um, I mean, the way it sort of started was when they were first, when they first announced Wasteland 2, I just got very excited because I was like, I'm a fan of Wasteland, I'm a fan of Fallout. Um, and I sent him some fan work that I actually did, just a couple of screenshots that I, I put together on Twitter. And then he sent me a message and was like, that's awesome. Um, and then we, nice. we just, yeah, we, we kind of just like kept in, in contact. And then when it, when it came to, um, when they were looking at doing Wasteland 3, and it was quite early on, and I think that he was just sort of like thinking about the ideas and he wanted somebody to take what he was thinking of and just put it into some sort of visual medium that he could show other people. Mm. And I don't think that he wanted to tell the rest of the company at that point yet. I think it was just the sort of like very um, personal idea that he had. And he was like, he, he, he can write it out and he could explain it. But, you know, if you show a mock-up screenshot of a game to somebody, they can pretty much get it quite easily. Mm. Um, and then we, we met him at, at GDC. Um, we were actually staying at the same hotel with him and we were introduced to the rest of the team. Um, and yeah, it, it was just, it was a fantastic relationship of kind of like getting his ideas and then translating them to something that he could show the rest of the team. And it was, I think it was quite a, a pure process for him to just send us three lines yeah. and like and make this. Interesting enough, um, I think why we were able to do it so well, um, and um, it is something that we, we might, you know, we're developing our own games, but it might be another business that there's potential to do something with other people. We didn't really have the time uh, to do it at the moment, but it essentially goes back to our commercial art uh, roots. That's essentially what clients would do with us. You know, we, they come with a concept for a building that give us um, rough plans. And we you know we were in the early phase of development and then we'd like flesh out the concept and then eventually all the way down to doing the presentation. And then after a year do, or two doing the marketing material uh, mm. to sell um, off plan or whatever the case may be. So we sort of are used to coming in early in the project, interpreting the ideas and sort of channeling their creativity into doing yeah. something. I think it kind of tightly aligned with what we do. I don't think it's more just like to do like concept artists, but um, we were using a computer, not necessarily sketching anything. Yeah. We're actually doing and like, I, through like mock-ups. Yeah. yeah. And I think the fact that we are sort of game developers, um, we, we know the, the limitations that somebody would actually work. You know, if you, you go to a traditional illustrator and you like, you want to, they, they must, uh, do an illustration of what this role-playing game must actually look like. They might not know sort of like what's the standard size of a character in a role-playing game. How would, you know, how wide does a road have to be for a, a computer-generated car to actually drive through? It's just really small things that I think that you kind of, you only learn through experience. And I think that, um, uh, I mean, obviously speaking for Brian here, but I think that he liked <laughs> the fact that we could, we could take his, his ideas and, I think translated into something um, quite visual and tangible without a lot of back and forth. 
Um, it was sort of it, it was a it was a, yeah. a, a very organic process. So it was a cool it was a cool process, and also really interesting for us because obviously we we're uh, we're homegrown developers, so it was awesome for us at a latter part in the project to actually mm. um, see how um, a an AA or now they're heading up to triple A type production, but how how a game studio almost the grandfathers of, yeah. of game developers, how they actually work. It was really interesting. Yeah, um, so we, we learned a lot. Yeah, we got to actually yeah. work then with their art directors um, yeah. and, and that in, in the process. We actually went to their offices when we, we went to... Um, went to Irvine and when, stuff. Yeah, went and, to Irvine and actually yeah. met the team there. And it really... Um, they're just such a nice group of people. Like, it's... Right. it's they're, they're, they're very just, cool. They're so, very cool. They're, I, I felt very uncool when I was yeah. there because they, <laughs> they're very, they really are quite... <laughs> Yeah, they're they're very yeah they're just really nice people and it was um it was a pleasure to work with and it was one of those things where like when I was doing it it was kind of one of those like pinch me moments of like you know we'd be doing concept art on Wasteland three <laughs> um and like I mean, it was email Brian Fargo here I've got his number in my phone you know? <laughs> um it really was and it was an, an amazing experience and it's mm-hmm. something that um I still keep in contact with him and uh, I'll. I'll I'd love to continue to work um, if we had the, the time to work with other developers um, and other larger studios on their on their games because it's 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 it was a special experience for me. Mm. Sounds great. I'm just listening to this yeah, how you guys are describing this. I hope you're not not opening up the can of worms here where you're going to get flooded with people. Hey, I have this idea. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that would be an interesting yeah, business game. to be in. I don't even know how you would describe something like that. But I could see a role for that kind of service. Yeah, I mean, you, you get, um, you know, if you look at brilliant concept artists like um, Feng, um, who uh, they just do brilliant stuff. Um, but there's some more sort of character and environments and stuff. I think there's definitely um, a need for people who can do almost sort of a benchmark type illustration. Not Normally it's done by the art, art team and that they'll mm-hmm. look at sort of benchmarks to move so if you're developing a game in say unreal or whatever the case may be you sort of have to it, it's it's concept arts normally used as a benchmark for everyone to understand that they're what they're doing and i think that if you can take it a step further and actually have benchmarks um illustrations of um of what you would like the game to look like i think yeah. there's definitely a need for that so it's, it's actually it's, something uh, that we actually do internally for for all of our projects mm-hmm. that, that we discuss because we um in, in between Desolation and Bone Totem, we sort of had a, a period where we were just kind of discussing yeah. games and Nick would just sort of like throw think, an idea out and then I would go and sit until late and actually do a little mock-up switch. We'll release it all one day. Like yeah. we, we, did, we did a lot of, we, after, after um, Beautiful Desolation, which we released at the end of February, um, uh, March COVID uh, hit obviously and uh, we were kind of stuck at home I never saw Chris for like three months because yeah. South Africa had a very serious lockdown you weren't allowed oh, we weren't wow. allowed out the house um, we had like the military in the road and all that sort of oh, stuff so yeah. um, so he would just sit on sit on there on on, um, on the on video chat and I'd sit on video chat and we just kind of came up with a whole bunch of different concept games um, I would have an idea he'd have an idea and we we had an idea for a Viking game and a space game. We kind of, we just, he was, I still, I would, like, I still like the Viking game. <laughs> I, would mock, cool. I would mock up little gameplay te- uh, uh, prototype, not just a very prototype, and Chris would send me concept images of what he'd want this thing to look like, and we then, we try to build it there. And then, um, obviously, at one point, we're like, oh, this is just not fun. It's not what we want to do in like another stasis game. We, we, we feel we've got it in us. So... Uh, we decided to sort of focus on that, uh, which is about six months ago or so. Um, I mean, really, like five months yeah, ago. Yeah, five months. I think, yeah, yeah we, we, and we're like, we've gone from just talking about the idea in May to actually May. releasing a demo in October. Yeah, about six months, about five, six, six months. months. Yeah. So we sort of, uh, yeah, I'm pretty impressed with that. Yeah. Like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, yeah, so we sort of, uh, we, we kind of uh, had, we had another space of story in us and it's only a story yeah. we wanted to tell for a while. We've been mulling around. So we said, no, let's do, let's do, let's do that. Uh, yeah, especially coming from, from Desolation, which took us three years and was a heck of a massive project. We're doing something small, telling a really cool, interesting story um, that uh, we're quite familiar with and seeing where we can push the, push the genre, borrowing from Day of the Tentacle, um, obviously. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, that's sort of how we, we got to where we are at the moment. Yeah. Everybody's going to be really excited about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
you know, by the time you're watching this video, the Kickstarter will have launched. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, we, <laughs> so yeah. I'll, we, I'll put a link. we're actually going to, we're not going to be using Kickstarter. Oh, on, we're not uh, using we, Kickstarter. We, we are going to be um, crowdfunding to some degree, but we're not, we, we're going to be doing our own thing. So we're not going to go with um, the sort of the. We're going to try to set up our, our, our own internal platform yeah. to do um, uh, so crowdfunding. Not, yeah. It's an experiment. So, yeah, for, you know, for us... Will it be um, crowdfunding or is it just pre-selling? Pre yeah, there, there will be... It's not... We're not, um, we're not super goal-orientated on the crowdfunding. It's mm -hmm. more sort of um, people can become a part of um, the process. Uh, get your name in the credits, name a character, that sort okay. of thing. We, we do have the funds from um, uh, Beautiful Desolation Sales. So we, we're a self-funding majority of the project. But um, we are having sort of a... There's a crowdfunding element to it. We want people to get involved and yeah. sort of... Uh, you know, uh, play the demo, um, you know, become part of the, uh, of the development. We're not necessarily zoning through to the money. That's not really too much of an issue at, at, yeah. at the moment. It's just because, um, I mean, I just, I just really enjoy the process of, mm -hmm. of um, working with fans and working with people who, who are like, sort of like coming along on, on, on the journey with us. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think that, uh, yeah, it, we're quite excited about, about, how we sort of like structured everything, um, and it, it's it's going to be, yeah, it is it is sort of a bit like a like a grand experiment in, in yeah. what we're actually trying to do. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we could People probably be able actually, to go to your site and sign up for yeah, a yeah, newsletter, yeah, yeah. pick a reward, and so almost almost a bit more like um, uh, Robert Space Industries, uh, yeah. Star Citizen, but not we're not selling assets or anything, but more sort of a self a self fund platform. We're not we um I think we're yeah. trying to we're trying to sort of move away from the idea of this like. 30 day time limit that you have to get your stuff funded on, on, on Kickstarter. Yeah. And because we're, we're in this for the long haul, you know, and mm -hmm. we, we, we're going to make the game. Like we, yeah, the game's we, going to get made whether people back it or not. We've actually had several publishers, you know, just say to us, you know, uh, can we um, just give you the money and then we'll publish the game for you or whatever. But we, we, re we don't really want to do that. So we sort of we prefer to do it ourselves with a bit of fan backing yeah. and uh, sort of, um, you know, not have we're, someone else interfere yeah. in the process. We're, we're, Touch wood now. Yeah, yeah, it sounds now. like a smart plan, really. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're fiercely independent. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because we 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 came from several years of being commercial artists. Um, and I, I do, I mean, I, I love doing commercial art. Like I, re I really, a part of me sometimes does miss working with clients in that. But there is this sort of like aspect of, um, I think once you've had the creative freedom and you, you you become a fully independent uh, creator, and that it's mm -hmm. very difficult to go back to have somebody else being like, no, you you can't do this, or like, what, what if we do this in this way? And I want to be like, no, like it's it's ours. Like, yeah. <laughs> get your hands off. Like, we're we're going to do this, and we're going to make this. Um, and any way that we can maintain our independence um, and uh, still be able to actually eat uh, is definitely mm -hmm. something that we definitely want to kind of embrace um, and, and go go down that yeah. path. That sounds great. So we'll <laughs> we'll put a link in the show notes to where people yeah. can go to uh, check. Yeah, it's stasis two stasis two dot com. Stasis yeah. that's easy to remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stasis two dot com. Let's check yeah. out what these guys are doing. I'm sure it's going to be absolutely. Fan. Yeah, people can go in there now and, and sign up on um, the mailing list, and we'll pop them an email when yeah. uh, when the game is live. And we're going to, as I said, we, we're launching a demo as well, so we're putting yeah. our money where our mouth is. People can play the game. Let us know what they hate and like about it, and, uh, and hopefully more about uh, what they like. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> well, you, you'd be surprised. You, you you kind of like you 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 get more out of what they hate, but it definitely sounds better to to get more of what they like about it. <laughs>that's all for this week's episode i hope you guys enjoyed that it's really fun getting to uh, meet nick and chris and talk to them about all of their games uh, you want to head over there to their website stasis2.com if memory serves and you can uh, get a lot of uh, little fun add-ons if you will uh, some ways to get yourself into the game uh, or just you know to uh, share a little love uh, help these guys uh, reach their dreams and uh, do what they like and frankly, make games that we <laughs> like to play. So uh, I think it's pretty cool what they have uh, set up there. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, 
Uh, as always, I want to thank you uh, for helping me uh, do what I do here at Matchat. Could not, would not do it without you. Thank you for supporting the show all these years, 460 episodes. You know, you're to blame for that. You're partially to blame. <laughs> all these Mad Chats. But look, guys, uh, I wanted to mention that I've, I've uh, updated my, my Patreon a little bit. So they got this new... Uh, feature where instead of doing those monthly payments, you can just come in and make a yearly sort of annual lump uh, sum payment uh, if you prefer to do that. And you know, I just set it up, I didn't even mention it, and people are already taking that option, so I guess it was <laughs> uh, long overdue. Uh, but I guess it's kind of nice if you don't want to be, you know, seeing these little bitty uh, uh, deposits or uh, withdrawals from your bank or whatever. Uh, you can just say, boom, I'm just going to drop, you know, 20 bucks on this uh, and just get it done. Um, Yes, <laughs> if that's easier for you, uh, certainly check that out over at the uh, Patreon site. And, of course, the link will be in the show notes. I uh, also appreciate it, guys, when you're uh, retweeting, liking, uh, posting about it on whatever social media you use. <laughs> Even just emailing it to buddies uh, that you uh, know might be interested in this stuff. Uh, whatever it is you do, guys, I appreciate it and thank you. All right, what about that news? All right, man, I am just overwhelmed with, <laughs> with news. Uh, most of it good. I think all of it good, actually. Uh, Jeff discorded in. Yes, we have a Discord now. I'm not uh, obsolete. We have upgraded to the uh, <laughs> majesty of Discord. <laughs> actually kind of enjoying it. I, I, uh, I'm glad I went ahead and set that up. If you're not on that, by the way, uh, you're certainly welcome. Uh, I don't know if the link is on YouTube or not, but you can find it over on the you know, Patreon site. Uh, anyway, uh, Jeff wrote in about Knox or Chaos. Do you remember uh, when I was interviewing those guys? Uh, they are just about ready to release this uh, game after all this time. Uh, they are having some issues with the uh, the floppy disk version. Uh, so if you had your hopes set on that, it's uh, you know might be a little bit more of a delay. Uh, they do give you the option to uh, just wait uh, for that to come out, or you can just grab the, I guess, the digital version that's out uh, soon and just uh, get that package later. So let's see. Uh, it will be stable on the Apple II emulator as well as a real Apple IIe, 2C, and 2GS hardware using an emulator, etc. Okay, let's move on then to uh, the second item. Shane wrote in about this, the Humble Bundle Ultimate Fantasy Bundle. Now, unfortunately, uh, the timing didn't work out too well on this, so you basically got a little bit left, a little bit more than a day uh, to hop over there and grab this bundle. Uh, I went ahead and picked it up. You know, it's 25 bucks. You get a whole bunch of uh, fantasy game assets. They got a bunch of creatures and armors and, and it was like a lock picking. A set of graphics, a bunch of other stuff, sound effects and whatnot. You know, in my opinion with that is, you know, even if like you got some vague plan, like maybe one day I'll get around to making something with Unity or Unreal, uh, you know, grab a package or two like this. It might get you inspired to go ahead and do that. But, you know, you never know when this might come in handy. You know, years down the road, you might want to use some of these assets. And that's actually happened to me. Uh, so I'm not just you know, making that up. <laughs> you can buy this package and maybe a few months from now, you hey, here I am using this lock picking set. Or maybe you, I just wanted to listen to some fantasy music uh, from this uh, music collection. So anyway, you, as you know, the Humble Bundle stuff, it goes for a good cause. In this case, it's uh, dosomething.org and World Land Trust. Uh, so you can also do it just to help out those organizations. But you know, I think you'll like the assets. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I love just loading uh, stuff up into Unity sometimes, just playing around with the models and the animations and stuff. It's just, it's just kind of fun. Kind of reminds me of a, like a, being a kid again with some Lego blocks. <laughs> uh, let's see what else. Uh, yes, we are continuing on with more news. Um, Pongo83 uh, wrote in about this. This is the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Uh, so they are finally getting around to releasing or announcing, I guess, that they are releasing or 
working on this remastered edition of the Mass Effect trilogy. Uh, it will include single player. I lost my place. <laughs> Go back. Uh, Mass Effect, well, the trilogy, promo weapons, armors, packs, all remastered and optimized for 4K Ultra HD. And that's coming spring 2021 for Xbox One, PS4, and PC with forward compatibility and targeted enhancements on Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5. And so that's very exciting news. You know, I'm, you know I got to admit, I, I, I really love uh, the Mass Effect trilogy. You know, I played all three of those games. I uh, loved every one. Played them all the way through. Uh, I think it's, I'm probably overdue. It's, it's probably been long enough now I could play those games again, and I've forgotten enough stuff where it would be fun again. Uh, so I always like to do that when there's a new, you know, remake or something. It's a good time to, to get back into it. You know, as I seem to recall, uh, the third game, was it, was it the third game where there was that sort of kerfuffle about the ending? You know, I think they might have uh, fixed that or something, right? Or uh, did a patch or a <laughs> uh, something. Anyway, uh, I just remember hearing that a lot of uh, people didn't like the ending of that game. Uh, so if you happen to know anything about that, it's been a while since I looked into it, uh, actually. So I'm curious if they, if this uh, new version will have the uh, fixed uh, uh, edition of that better ending. Uh, King Arthur... Knight's Tale. This is our fourth item, a little bonus item for you. 58 hours left on the clock on their Kickstarter. This thing looks awesome. Uh, this is a company out of Hungary, uh, Budapest, uh, Neocore Games, and it's called King Arthur's Knight Tale, Knight's Tale, a role-playing tactical game, and they describe it as a unique hybrid between turn-based, <laughs> turn-based, <laughs> turn-braised, ooh, turn-braised, yeah, that sounds delicious. Uh, anyway, turn-based tactical combat games like XCOM, huge XCOM fan, and traditional character-centric RPGs. So they're trying to do, uh, I guess, uh, a little bit of both here. Hopefully the, this will turn out well. Uh, I watched the movie, uh, the little uh, gameplay trailer, the, I guess, intro movie announcement, <laughs> promo video they made for this, and it looks really good. Uh, I think this looks really solid. If it plays as good as it looks, holy heck. I'm definitely going to be spending some time with this. It's uh, based on classic Arthurian, Arthurian King Arthur uh, mythology filtered through the dark fantasy tropes, a twist on the traditional tale of chivalry. And you know, I think the original stories are a little bit darker than most people think. You know, if all you've, uh, if the only version you've seen is the Disney Sword in the Stone or something like that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's plenty of darker versions of the tale already out there, so be curious to see what these guys do. Huge emphasis on moral choices, which have significant consequences in a rogue light structure, adding extra tension to the tactical and management decisions. So they're, they're talking a damn good talk, and their trailer looks really good, so keep an eye on this. You got 58 hours to pick up that uh, uh, discounted uh, Kickstarter tier. I forget what they call it, but about 28 bucks, I think, you can, uh, you know, get a digital copy of the game when that comes out. Okay, man, what a day. Let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was, uh, you know, Chris and Nick, they they talked a little bit about the trolley problem. You know, I've heard about that off and on, so I was, I was trying to learn more about it and just where, where the concept comes from and, and whatnot, uh, who came up with it. And I found a quote, and I don't really know how this ties to the trolley problem. I guess it does, sort of. Uh, but it's Marie von Ebner Eschen, Eschenbach uh, from her book, I guess, called Aphorisms. Uh, anyway, I just thought it was a cool quote. <laughs> it goes something like this. Their world would be in better shape if people would take the same pains in the practice of the simplest moral laws as they exert in intellectualizing over the most subtle moral questions. So ponder on that and see you guys next time.
welcome to one of the classic blunders. The most famous is never get involved in a land war in Asia, but only slightly less well known is this. Never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line. <laughs>